The case for convivial conservation. Remember this guy? Well, its fate is soon to be shared by many more species of animals and plants. Species that are key elements in ecosystems vital to us. Economic growth is putting continuous pressure on valuable habitats and species. So, what to do? Can we still change the tide? Can we protect the earth by putting a fence around half of it? We don't think so. We think trying to protect nature top down and at a distance is a losing battle. A battle that is turning more violent as biodiversity becomes scarcer. What about turning nature into a product? Allowing businesses to trade in nature's services and protect biodiversity with the profits. This sounds logical, but really isn't. Continued resource extraction and land use change, the root causes of biodiversity loss, are not addressed by this model. In fact, it even depends on them. There is an alternative. It's based on two main principles. The first, let nature flourish more freely and let people be part of it. Allow nature to flow deeper into our cities and integrate living spaces into ecosystems in a durable way. Some human places will become wilder. Some wild areas may become more human. Secondly, we need to transform the economy. Right now, it is highly unequal and leads to intolerable pressure on the planet. We must balance and align human needs with those of the rest of life. An economy demanding endless growth can't accomplish this. To ensure that all life can flourish, the wealth that we already have must be distributed more equally. We call this whole earth vision, convivial conservation. This requires changes in three main domains. The first is landscapes. How can we rethink rural and urban landscapes so that humans and other life forms can flourish side by side? Second, we need to change how conservation is financed. For instance, a conservation basic income for people living near biodiverse areas could support sustainable livelihoods and lead to forms of development based on care rather than competition. Finally, we'll need to organise conservation more democratically. This means that those with the largest footprints must change their livelihoods the most, even if they live far from conservation spaces. While inspired by countless initiatives under development in many places, the convivial conservation revolution is only just beginning. Much help is needed to expand this emerging vision into a movement able to transform policy and practice throughout the world. Get on board.